Kalispera says, um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's seminar. Thank you all for tuning in. And an even bigger thanks to our speaker, Professor Michael Hurstfield, um, who's on the other side of the globe and has been kind enough to wake up at some ungodly hour to participate in this presentation. But before we venture into tonight's topic, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Jim Bosanakis as the sponsor of uh, the seminar. And would like to encourage you all to become a sponsor of a seminar of your choice. We still have a few uh, vacant slots. Uh, we have some fascinating seminars coming up. Um, next week um, is one by the University of Crete, Dr. Socrates Petmezas, who will be elaborating on the status of the Ozabasides and their role in the 1821 revolution. Uh, these were communal Christian notables who had a privileged status under the Ottoman administration, they also went by other names like Proisti and Dimoyerondes, and during the war independence also strove to retain their influence and power uh, in the quest for an independent Greece. Uh, the seminar will be delivered in Greek. Now let's turn our attention to our speaker tonight. Uh, for anyone following Greek studies or any area of social anthropology, it would be unthinkable if they weren't aware of the decades-long work and research on identity construction in Greece of Professor Michael Hurstfield. Under Greek law, honorary naturalization, dimitiki polytographici, may be granted to people who have provided exceptional services to the country whose naturalization serves the public interest. May I proudly add that only a few weeks ago, um, Professor Hurstfield's honor was notified that honorary Greek citizenship will be bestowed upon, upon him as a result of his long-term contributions to Greek studies. On behalf of the Greek community of Melbourne and all Greek Australians, I'd like to personally congratulate Professor Hurstfield on this much-deserved distinction. Michali, Tapio, and Atipro Sinigasu, Kekalistinechia. And living in times where academic freedoms are being curtailed, where humanity courses globally under attack, and even the status of academia and science has been questioned, it's so important to have people like Professor Hurstfield disseminating their knowledge and seeking their opinions. Let me quote a few lines from a past interview that Professor Hurstfield gave. The fact that anthropology is an academic discipline is a strength because academic freedom is a precious good that means we don't have to accept others' attempts to dictate what we say or think. For anthropologists, that the discipline has a basic universities gives them the right, a mandate, and an obligation to be forthright in identifying that falsification of genuine knowledge that too often pervades the world in which we live. At the same time, admitting the imperfection and provisionality of our knowledge is itself an important aspect of knowing. I'll let you dwell on these words by Professor Hurstfeld. But without critical thinkers and without public intellectuals, uh, our world is much poorer. Uh, now a few words on his academic career. London-born Professor Hurstfeld was educated at the Universities of Cambridge, where he did his uh, BA in Archaeology and Anthropology. Um, later on, um, he did a course in Greek folklore at the University of Athens. This was followed by an MA in Modern Greek Studies at the University of Birmingham. And, and finally, he did his PhD in Social Anthropology uh, at Oxford University. Before moving to Harvard, he taught at uh, Vassar College and Indiana University. He has been a visiting professor at numerous universities, uh, which also include the University of Melbourne, intermittently since 2004, and he has held visiting research appointments at the ANU in Canberra, University of Sydney, and also the University of Adelaide. So it's good to see that Australian connection there. He has presented previously at the Greek Centre, so when he's able to return to Australia, uh, in the hopefully not too distant future, we'd definitely like to have him back in the flesh, again presenting at the mezzanine level of the Greek Centre. I won't outline his awards or extensive publication list, but will highlight two of his classic works, um, two books that were released in the 80s, Ours Once More, Folklore, Ideology and the Making of Modern Greece by Austin University Press in 1982, and The Poetics of Manhood, Contest and Identity in a Cretan Mountain Village uh, by Princeton University Press in 1985. His seminar tonight is entitled 
1821 revolution and the Greek village life today. I'm sure it will be fascinating as the rural village lies at the heart of the Greek national imagination and identity. Professor Hurstfield, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Kalimera from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's exactly uh, five in the morning here, um, but uh, uh, I, let me uh, assure you that I'm wide awake uh, and very happy uh, to be with you uh, on this occasion. Uh, I'd like to thank Nick in particular for those very kind words uh, and to say that uh, getting this notification uh, of, of my forthcoming citizenship was something of a surprise and certainly uh, a great honor uh, for me because Greece is a country that uh, I have had very close to my heart since my uh, adolescent years, in fact. Um, I learned Greek originally when I was about 16 years old. Uh, I learned it on my own. I'm after the doctors, um, and I sometimes tease my friends who are language teachers and say, see, it's actually much much better to learn a language on your own. But um, I think it was simply the enormous appeal of the country uh, that uh, inspired me to do that. And I would also like to say that my many encounters with the Greeks of Australia, and particularly with the Greek community of Melbourne, uh, have afforded me enormous amounts of pleasure. And I want to thank you, uh, even at this great distance that we find ourselves right now, uh, for your friendship. Uh, and your interests, and I do also echo uh, Nick's hope that we'll be able to do something like this again in the near future, Apokonda. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to open up uh, my uh, uh, my uh, uh, PowerPoint, and uh, let me just make sure that it's visible to everyone, and um, we will Oops, it doesn't seem to be moving. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to go straight into uh, the heart of the matter um, because uh, I want to keep more or less uh, to time and um, say, first of all, that uh, there's a lot known about the composition of Greek society at the time of the 1821 revolution. And clearly, although the movers and shakers uh, were either uh, from larger towns or, or leaders of uh, uh, groups of clefts, and we'll talk about who the clefts really were uh, from the rural hinterlands. Um, there were many other groups of people who were crucially involved. And at that time, not all of them were either conscious of being Elines, they called themselves Romyi, some of them, indeed, were not Romyi because they were not even Christian. There were certainly some Muslims who fought on the side of the revolution as well. Uh, because these were all groups of people who wanted to fight against the power of the Ottoman Empire. And we know quite a bit about various social institutions that existed, both uh, in the Greek mainland and in the islands at that time. Um, and some of these uh, elements have been taken up uh, in recent historiography, uh, especially by official sources, and made to be part of the story. Now, uh, I am certainly not denying their importance. Um, the so-called Krifoskolio, uh, for example, the secret school, uh, the role of the priesthood in rallying people together, the uh, the clergy in uh, in Constantinople may not have been all that keen on the idea of, of uh, a national revolution, and they certainly feared the idea of a resurgence of ancient Greek paganism. Uh, but uh, in the villages, the priesthood, the clergy, uh, was pretty solidly uh, behind uh, anything that would uh, rid them of the supervision of the Ottoman powers with much of the repression that went with that, even though the Ottoman Empire itself was staffed by a wide variety of different uh, language-speaking groups, uh, including certainly some Greeks in very high office. Um, some of the elements that existed and that we do know about beyond the, uh, the secret schools um, was the internal, the, the internal organization of the villages, um, the so-called Dimo Yerondia, the, the uh, uh, leadership uh, 
that in some ways seem to prefigure or perhaps even to echo from the past ideals of uh, democratic problem solving. Models of solidarity and especially of mutual aid, Alilovoithia, which uh, frankly are not often mentioned by anthropologists or anyone else, but there certainly was a concept that people uh, living together in a village should help each other. That concept was crisscrossed, of course, by uh, allegiance to various uh, family and kinship units. And I'm going to be talking, just to prove to you that I really am an anthropologist, about kinship a bit further on in this talk. But the ideal of Alilovoithia was certainly present. Villages even then were seen as the archetypical seats of moral and spiritual identity. And that spirituality was grounded in the Orthodox Christian religion. So the village was often seen as a microcosm of the confessional community of all, uh, 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 all Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox people, whether they spoke Greek or Turkish or some other language. And they, of course, were known as Romyi. Uh, the uh, term Romyos, as a self-designator for Greeks, has gone out of fashion. And that is another part of the history, which we perhaps should talk about on another occasion. But um, even today, uh, I would say that the term Romyos is used by Greeks uh, as a sign of self-recognition. And I'm sure you all know the, uh, uh, the, the self-deprecating phrase, uh, half a brain, and that one is Romaic. Uh, the idea being that um, somehow being Romios, uh, you confess to all of the various elatomata, uh, the various weaknesses uh, of your identity, while when you presented yourself as an Elinas, you were presenting yourself as the proud heir to the ancient Greek, uh, the ancient Greek uh, spirit. And that spirit had been kept alive in some form or other uh, in the language. There is no question but that the modern Greek language, with all of the extraordinary vicissitudes that it's gone through, and with all of the flexibility that a language has to absorb elements from uh, other languages as well, and to uh, evolve internally, is continuous with the many forms of ancient Greek that existed um, in antiquity. Most of all, however, the ideal of the village itself, the Horyo, uh, became very quickly the symbol and focus of Greek identity following the 1821 revolution. And it's very easy to see why, because in 1821, the vast majority of Greeks lived in villages. Uh, the flight to the cities that took place, especially in the uh, aftermath of the Civil War, so in the 50s, uh, and continuing right up to our time, uh, is a relatively recent phenomenon. And Greece still remains, in a certain sense, a rural-based society. And it, the sense in which I want to emphasize that it is still a rural society is this, that even today, a family that is down on its luck in the city usually has relatives back in the ancestral Huryo and can go back to the village and uh, 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 find a way to live. Now, obviously, for a young person who's grown up in Athens or Thessaloniki, it's very hard to go back to life on the land. But life on the land isn't quite the way it used to be. Uh, you all saw the donkey that uh, was paraded through the streets of that village that I think was used to illustrate uh, my talk today. Uh, well, you're not going to see many donkeys in villages these days. There are very few left, surprisingly few. Um, most of the villagers I know uh, do their business with trucks, which enable them not only to move in and around the hinterland of the village itself, but to connect their lives in the village with commercial and other forms of activity in the cities. So the fact of the matter is that the village is still there, but it's part of a larger whole. Now, uh, early anthropologists, and here is a picture of my own wonderful late teacher, John Campbell, whose book, Honor, Family and Patronage, 1964, some of you may well know. Um, in his day, uh, when he was doing his research in the 50s, Greece was still predominantly rural. The move to the cities had begun, 
but it was not yet uh, as uh, wholesale as it was to become by the end of that decade or by the time he published his book. The Sarakatsani uh, were and are a shepherding people of northern Greece. They're Greek speaking. So they, uh, various studies have been made to attempt to connect them with the ancient Greeks. Well, you know, the connection with ancient Greece is there uh, uh, along with so much else uh, in all parts of Greece, I think. But um, what Campbell particularly noticed was that the Sarakatsani were unusual, although he thought it was actually a much commoner pattern in that uh, their family organization was based on the nuclear family, mother, father, and kids. That was it. So that every family unit, every nuclear family unit had to be self-sufficient. And there was very little co cooperation of any kind among families. So this actually, they actually represent in their semi-nomadic lives uh, an extreme uh, of absence of Adelavoithia. Their kinship system uh, the, the pre preferred kinship reckoning is done in terms that anthropologists call the bilateral kindred. The bilateral kindred is basically the group of people that whoever is speaking recognizes as his or her relatives. Those, so the only two people who ever uh, share a kindred are siblings, brothers and sisters. Um, now that may seem like a, an obvious description of the family, but there are many other forms of social organization that involve kinship. And at the time of the 1821 revolution, much of Greece was occupied by people who were, yes, organized in nuclear families up to a point, but their primary loyalty was to the clan. And the clan was an identity inherited entirely in the male line, so from father to father. So those people who had the same surname could plausibly uh, claim uh, to be uh, uh, members of the same clan and therefore related to each other. And in some areas, those clans uh, went in for a lot of corporate action. That is, they owned property together. Uh, they uh, defended their identity and their rights together. And we still see references to the clan in strange places. For example, in marriage announcements, where the bride is often described as being of the clan of the male identity of such and such a person. So it hasn't completely disappeared, but uh, nation states, and Greece is no exception, prefer the bilateral kindred to the clan. And if you will come with me later in this talk to Crete, you will understand why, because on Crete, we have one part of Greece, which is still predominantly organized in patrilineal clans. And it's made a huge difference because a patrilineal clan can resist the state in two ways. First, it can mass together a large group of armed men. So in the village I'm going to talk about, uh, you will get clans of maybe four or 500 people. And of those people, maybe 150 will be um, uh, will be adult males. Now, why is this important? Well, first of all, because it means that there is a challenge to the authority of the state. And when the state was the Ottoman Empire, not the modern Greek state, that was a matter of considerable importance and of deep concern uh, to the uh, uh, Ottoman authorities. Turkish culture itself um, also is patrilineally organized, so they certainly knew what they were dealing with. But in Europe, most states were pushing away from that kind of organization. The second reason is that organization in clans supports a certain kind of patronage, of corruption, if you will, but I prefer to avoid the word corruption because it, to me it's too moralistic. But if I am a leading figure in my clan and a politician is willing to make a deal with me to protect my, my, uh, my flocks, to provide uh, work for my children in the city, uh, possibly to get my grandparent a hospital bed when no other uh, means is available, I will pledge to work to get the votes of my clan behind that politician. So the two reasons that the state is very uneasy with clans. One is the, the, uh, the, um, the simple fact that 
the numbers mean that plans could become sites of resistance, certainly during the War of Independence, that's exactly what happened, but also of criminality. And the second is that uh, they can uh, provide a focus for much larger scale uh, favor peddling uh, in political terms. This is one of John Campbell's um, uh, uh, informants from an old Sarakatsan man uh, from his book. But we also know about other Sarakatsani. Uh, For example, uh, Karais Gakis was a Sarakatsanos. And we don't know really very much about whether he was able to call on clan loyalties. Uh, but certainly the other uh, guerrilla leaders, the cleftists, we'll talk about them in a moment, in the villages uh, were able to gather large numbers of people together and at least the core of their marauding bands, because that's what they were, uh, tended to be made up of clan members, of clan mates. So let's talk about this term, cleftis. What we have with this word is um, something that the archaeologist Wayson Thompson in, in 1913 called political philology. That somehow the words are massaged to suit retrospectively uh, the national ideology. Before 19, sorry, sorry, before 1821, the word kleptis, which in Katharavasa Greek was kleptis, simply meant thief. And there was also a word listis, which is a word of classical origin. Uh, and that word meant something bigger than just a petty thief. That would be a big thief or a, a, a brigand. So uh, these words had uh, their forms in both demotic and Katharavasa. So kleptis, kleptis in the plural, and list and uh, uh, kleptis, uh, klepte, kleptis and klepte uh, in, in Katharevasa. After 1821, and especially after 1834, with the consolidation of the new Greek state uh, under a Greek, uh, well, actually a German king, but um, who was given the title of King of the Hellenes, and under Greek governance, uh, there was a need to deal with the fact that some of these gentlemen, especially the more powerful clan leaders uh, in the Peloponnese, continued the struggle, not against the Ottoman Empire, but against the Greek government. They saw the German king as an invasive figure. They saw the establishment that was rapidly settling into power in Athens as a foreign supported and intrusive uh, entity. And they went on fighting. And so the government, and especially the academics who supported the government, who were philologists and folklorists for the most part, some archaeologists, started to work on the language in a way that would make uh, it very clear who was on whose side. So the word kleptis remained in Katharevusa as the word for a petty thief, and it continued with that meaning in Demotic Greek as well as kleptis, kleptis. Then the word listis, however, was separated out. And um, the Katharevusa word kleftis with a phi instead of a p, an f instead of a p, right? Kleftis was separated from kleptis. So kleftis meant a petty thief, but kleftis meant one of these heroic figures from the War of Independence. That distinction didn't exist until the revolution. Uh, but because, in fact, the origins of uh, the guerrilla resistance to the Ottoman Empire lay in these patrilineally organized bands uh, who raided each other and then began to raid the wealthy and finally also were organized to fight against the Turks, these, these groups were... Um, uh, Certainly, very, they played a very important role in the revolution. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the, the large numbers of them who continued to resist authority because they didn't really understand that uh, now things had changed and now they were under a Greek government that was their government, uh, they had to be given a different name. So they were dismissed as brigands, as listes, 
Listes in Demotic. So that became a new Demotic word, as opposed to both the Kleptes, who were these heroic figures, and the Kleptes, who were just petty thieves. We see similar things happening uh, around the, uh, the Balkans so, and, and beyond the Italian word bandito, meaning somebody who's been exiled to the, to the far reaches. The Serbian Hajduk, the Bulgarian Hajduk, and in, on the island of Crete, the word Hainis also had the same meaning. Now, in order to understand this a little bit more uh, clearly and to see why kinship, in, 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 kinship organization was so important, uh, to the uh, uh, to the revolution, we need to think a little bit like anthropologists. Uh, why is kinship important? Well, obviously, everybody knows the family is very important in Greece, and there's no question about that. That is a central part of Greek identity. But the organization of the family is different from area to area. And what has happened since the early 19th century right up to the present is that very quickly those areas where patrilineal identity was important began to put less and less emphasis on that identity and more and more emphasis on the nuclear family. And that, but the emphasis never entirely disappeared. So this is why you still have uh, big families uh, that continue to be known by their surnames, which is certainly a mark of clan identity. You have the Karamanlides, you have the Mitsotakides, and so on. Just as uh, in the United States, for example, you have the, uh, the Bushes, and you have the Roosevelts, and so on. Um, so uh, accusations that these families are trying to create uh, dynasties uh, have some basis in, in historical fact, even if they don't necessarily represent the present day situation. And this is a phenomenon that has happened all over the Western world, certainly all over Western and Eastern Europe, that gradually clan identities faded. There are a few places where clans are still powerful. In the Balkans, we find them in Albania, very prominently, and in Serbia, especially, and other parts of former Yugoslavia, but especially Serbia and Montenegro. In Greece, they really only exist now in Mani, and especially in Western Crete, where they are still, to some extent, corporate uh, entities. And we'll see a little bit about that more uh, in a moment. But Greek village family practices vary also in other ways. So, for example, naming practices. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with and probably represent the practice of naming children after uh, the parents' parents. Uh, but the order in which that is done varies enormously. And interestingly enough, it turns out to vary with local inheritance practices. So for example, um, in on the island of Rhodes, uh, all the children get uh, equal parts of the inheritance. And that's actually not uncommon in other parts of Greece as well. The first male child gets the father's father's name. The second male child gets the mother's father's name. The first female child gets the mother's mother's name. And the second female child gets the father's mother's name. So that produces a distribution of names that looks very much like the equal distribution of the properties. In fact, what they do, if you have five children and five fields, you don't give one field to each child, you divide each field into five parts. So each child gets a package of five pieces of fields. And what this means in practice is that the naming practice reproduces ideas about property. But go to Karpathos, for example, and you will find that the first daughter gets everything that came from the mother. The first son gets everything that came from the father. It's the daughter, by the way, who gets the house because the house is transmitted from mother to daughter there. And all the other children in the old days were forced to go abroad. They used to go to uh, Istanbul, to Constantinople, to, to uh, look for work there uh, in the days of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, now, more recently, of course, they've come to Athens and other places because they did not inherit actual land property. And I could go on at great length about this, but the point is precisely that, and over the, the 
the, the Greek mainland especially, that's huge variation so that even neighboring villages might have different practices. So there are different local ideologies about what matters uh, in terms of how families deal with properties. We've already talked about the shift from clans to nuclear families over time. It happened unevenly. It didn't really happen very much in Crete, but in much of Greece, and especially in the cities, the, the family is, for obvious reasons, the unit uh, that matters most. Uh, if you're living in a polykatikia in Athens or Thessaloniki, uh, it's very hard to imagine any group larger than a nuclear family, maybe one or two grandparents, but that's it. And certainly nothing like the Slavic Zadruga, which is a patrilineally based extended family involving very often three, four, or even five generations connected all through male lines, and therefore acting like a kind of mini clan. Right? Um, and um, at the time of the revolution, most people's primary identity was as a Romios, as a member of the Greek Orthodox Church, as a member of a village, and as a member of a household or a clan. Um, village solidarity was strong. And even in those days, uh, for example, it's clear that you didn't raid flocks from shepherds in your own village. And that's still true on Crete, by the way, where there's still a certain amount of animal theft. The rule is you raid in other villages. So the village identity was really important. Um, and if you raid a fellow villager, you can get into real trouble. Your own fellow villagers might then uh, end up uh, destroying your, 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 your flock. Now, another way of looking at kinship is to look at the terms people use for kinship. And this, again, is a, a big hobby among anthropologists. It's particularly interesting in, in on the island of Crete, where the word ikoyenya means two things. It means both the family and the clan. So when somebody says, I do this for my ikoyenya, you have to listen very carefully to the context. It's actually a very clever way of disguising the fact that while everybody agrees that the defense of your nuclear family is a good thing, a lot of people are not so sure it's so good to defend your clan. After all, it might be defending it from charges of corruption or even violence or criminal activity. The word ikoyenya, of course, contains the classical Greek Yenos, which was a patrilineal clan. And the, if, the, if a Cretan wants to emphasize that he really is talking about a patrilineal clan, he'll use the word yenya, which is not yenea, the meaning generation. Yenya with a yot, that means exactly that, the patrilineal clan. There are other differences. So, for example, you know that the cuñados is the wife's brother, right? Not on Crete. On Crete, it's more often the father's brother's sister or the father's sister's, uh, sorry, the father's brother's son or the father's sister's son. That's um, uh, very unusual in other parts of, in fact, I think it doesn't exist anywhere else uh, or in, in mainland Greece, certainly, but um, on Crete, you will still hear the word kunyabos to mean exadrophos, cousin. And there are other words for close kin, so brother and sister, ablos, abla, daughter, a nice classical Greek word, this one, thigatera, and the father is chiris, which of course is the same root as kyrios, so it's your master, the paterfamilias, if you will. Now, it may strike you as odd that in talking about the 1821 revolution, I'm mostly going to be talking about an island that didn't actively take part in that revolution, wasn't able to. Um, there was certainly an uprising on Crete at that time, and there had been many uprisings before that, perhaps in part because uh, Crete became an autonomous uh, entity under the Greek crown in 1898 and was only finally united with Greece in 1913. That may be part of the reason that it, uh, it maintains such a separate identity for so long and also maintained this very different social structure. Uh, even though many of these clans played important roles in national Greek politics, the Venizelias and the Mitsotaki, those again, you know, perfect examples of this. Um, and indeed, there was a long tradition of resistance to foreign invaders. 
Uh, about the same time as the revolt in the Peloponnese, in the Moria, as it was then known, was another revolt in uh, Crete, the revolt of Daskaloyanis, a local leader from Sfakia. It ended badly, as most revolts against the Ottoman Empire did. Um, and there were sporadic other revolts, certainly in support of the revolution in 1821, the most famous of which, of course, was the sack of the uh, uh, of the Venetian monastery at Arcadi in 1866. Uh, we'll come back to Arcadi in a moment. But I also wanted to draw your attention to the fact that because Crete has been the site of very energetic archaeological activity, Cretans will often point to their uh, connections with the Minoan rather than the classical period. Cretans are not separatists. They simply regard themselves as better Greeks than any others. And uh, they, they, they will point to phenomena like this. This is a stone-built shepherd's hut, and there are lots of them around the village where I worked, which is a village called Zonyana in west central Crete. Um, and we'll say, you know, these, these are built with dry, dry, uh, dry stone walling. Um, they are modeled on the ancient Greek Tholos tombs. So they actually look remarkably like inverted Mycenaean or Minoan tombs. Now, to get the larger picture, I just want to uh, run through a, a couple of ideas here. One is to understand Greek independence. You have to understand that in 1821, and for much of Greek history, it, it was pretty conditional. Greece was allowed to indeed encouraged to be an independent country by the Western powers, but on condition that they did it in the way that the Western powers wanted. And that meant the creation of a national narrative about national identity, uh, the idea that you couldn't be Greek unless you were thoroughly Greek. They confused cultural identity with the bloodline. Um, the idea that minorities could be loyal Greeks was became increasingly suspect, even though in 1821 there were an awful lot of people uh, uh, in Greece who took part in the revolution, didn't speak Greek, and there were also a lot of people who didn't look Greek. There were people of African origin, there were people of Arab origin, and so on. Um, in the most remarkable uh, history, if you like, of, of cultural engineering, all of that pretty much had disappeared by 1921 or 1922, let's say, an important day too. So this state of adjusting to a model imposed by the great powers is something that I call crypto-colonialism. And even to this day, Greeks complain about the colonial attitude, for example, of Germany towards Greece. Uh, and this is perhaps something we can pick up in discussion. I've already talked about patrilineality and it's not to be confused with patriarchy. Patriarchy is about power. Patrilineality is simply about kinship organization. And when we talk about segmentation, it simply means that clans can subdivide at many different levels. So if um, you have a fight with your first cousin, the groups that are going to be involved in that fight are very small. But if you have a fight with somebody who is your fifth cousin, um, it's going to be much larger groups. And of course, if you're fighting with somebody who's not even a member of your clan, the whole clan might get involved. I have recently coined the term subversive archaism to describe the way in which people in Crete continue to resist the authority of the bureaucratic state, even while being not just loyal Greeks, but certainly among those who would most willingly go to war against any outside enemy. So they are subversive of this idea that the country is still ruled by people who uh, represent the interests of the great powers. And in that sense, they continue the tradition of those cleftists who continued to resist the power of the state even after it became Greek. And of course, a lot of this is bound up with ideas about masculinity. All of these leaders of clans, both in 1821, but also today in Crete, are men who put on a huge performance of masculinity involving excellence with arms, with weapons, uh, great pride in big whiskers, 
um, and, and a willingness to take on all comers and again, to sacrifice their lives for the country. Hence this rather nice mandinada, opus in inimera clis, gestan mata technitis, inda de theridi sui, istonisitsikritis. Whoever is not a person who enjoys life and is really good with weapons, what on earth does he want with life on the island of Crete? Patrilineal clans, and uh, this is an example of, of, of a, a clan document from Zoniana, often transmit names, uh, not just the surname, but also first name, so that Anastos was the founder of one group within this larger clan. His child, Dimitris, therefore, was known as Anasto Dimitris, and his descendants would be known as the Anasto Dimitris, and so on. And here's one of these Anastides, um, whose grandfather was at the siege of Arcadi in 1866 and died there. And he actually, in the 1970s, when I knew him, composed a poem celebrating his grandfather's exploits. And he's so identified with his grandfather, who had the same name as his, because again, the patrilineal succession is very clear, that he just burst into tears as he recited his poem. But there's another side to, uh, to Greece in the 19th century, which of course is the urban desire to imitate uh, and adopt the customs of the West, clothing especially, also mannerisms. Um, this kind of public touching would be unthinkable in a village, but already in the 19th century, uh, and I would actually argue that some of the so-called village values were themselves imported uh, ideals from Victorian England and elsewhere. Now, displays of masculinity also uh, involve displays of force, of numbers. So here is a, a double baptism feast. Actually, it's a baptism at a wedding. And it's uh, a big feast, which shows you not only huge number of members of the clan, but also the important people they have connections with from other villages, many of them possibly families whose sheep they'd raided in the previous generation. Uh, that's often the way that people create uh, alliances there. Meat is central, uh, huge amounts of meat. This was taken in the 70s. This was taken just about three or four years ago. Uh, meat is now, of course, in a very prosperous uh, village like this uh, in huge quantities and a man demonstrates his masculinity by putting on enormous uh, feasts of, uh, of, of meat um, for baptisms again as in this case and weddings and there they are having a fine old time but but what's interesting is that although men now are as competitive with each other as they were before they will stand up for their families. They will stand up for their clans. But now, instead of only eating meat and never touching anything that looks like a salad, in public at least, because that would be effeminate behavior, now they boast of their garden produce and they eat it too. So some things change, but the idea that masculine pride is the core of the patrilineal clan has not disappeared at all but you can now express it in salad rather than in meat. And it's amazing how many of the villagers actually do that. This is an old picture uh, from a, I'm trying a slide where somebody's cutting an, a samya, a mark into, the, uh, into a sheep because this sheep apparently wandered into their flock. And so it was very easy to steal. <laughs> and so it'd been incorporated. Interestingly enough, the mark put on the ear is called the Samya, which is the ancient Doric form of the word Sameon, Simeo in modern Greek, meaning a, a, a sign. So there's another ancient connection. But with all of the stories of violence, look at the stop sign on the top right hand corner. Um, we also have to remember that people in these villages are not living now separated from uh, the reality in the cities or from modern currents of thought. So while, yes, they still put up shrines when there are accidents, these old religious practices are very important to them. They also respect the environment. So here is a sign that says attention. This is a biological cultivation. Um, the village adapts 
to the modern world while continuing to preserve a social structure much closer to that of 1821 rural communities than you would find in anywhere on the mainland today. Um, the Cretans not only continued these, these associations, they were also very proud of the role they, can, they played in resistance against the Turks. This is uh, the uh, father of Andreas Nanadakis, the, the uh, Cretan novelist about whom I've written a biography. Uh, and you see he's standing on a captured Ottoman flag. But right from the start, there was real tension between those who uh, in the cities were nonetheless of, of rural origin. So the gentleman in the Fustanella on the right hand side here, and those who instead promoted ideals of European identity. I wanted Greece to be in Evropi, to be a part of the modern world. And that tension um, in a way continues down to the present day. Some of these traditional garbs were, uh, were adopted as part of the national patrimony. So the Evzons, for example, but notice what this Evzon is doing. This is a goose step. The goose step was a German invention. This is a relic of the German monarchy, the Bavarian monarchy that Greece acquired in 1834. And it's still there. Interesting enough, this particular form of military drill is no longer permitted in Germany, where it's associated both with the Nazi period, but more particularly with Bismarckian uh, Prussian militarism. And Germans have decided they wanted me to do with it. Um, so this F zone is being presented to tourists as uh, an embodiment of of a uh, national tradition. The reality is that the Fustanella was actually worn much more by Albanian and Slavic speaking groups than by Greek speaking groups. The Greek speaking groups tended more to wear the vraka, the, the baggy trousers. There were some who wore the Fustanella for sure, but these lines of, of identity were not as clear in 1821 as they have been made to be today. And in a way it's by cultural management from the top, that in the name of nat national identity, the Greek leadership has also managed to make Greece look like a normal nation state in the family of European nations. So there is something about being a Romyos that consists, continues to this day. I always love this picture. I've tried to disguise the gentleman, but the idea that you can happily sit in a taverna and smoke your cigarette under a sign that says smoking forbidden uh, certainly appeals to the rebellious part of me. And that kind of rebelliousness sometimes breaks out, uh, especially when the government is seen to be cozying up too much to the European Union. Uh, the uh, pro-EU group won a, a national referendum uh, on Brexit by a very narrow margin. Greece was lucky, they stayed in. Uh, I don't particularly like the European Union as an institution, but its, its weaknesses, its fault, and its unfairness, and especially its unfairness to Greece, should be fought from within. You can't fight it from outside. So leaving it just would have left Greece incredibly weak. However, um, resistance against continuing, especially German pressure, on Greece, I think draws a great deal on these images of villagers who resist the power of the center. So again, demonstrations galore. And in the tradition of the old Greek villages where the local papas would be involved. So in this group of people seeing Theodorakis songs and demonstrating again against then the George Papandreou government, uh, we see the, uh, the priest Perhaps an unusual combination, but there it is. Nothing unpatriotic about this because exercising the democratic right of protest is considered to be a strong Greek tradition. People running, this is a photograph I took in the Athens Metro when the government started using tear gas against the demonstrators and even breaking into the uh, agricultural bank of Greece. <laughs> 
Look at that. They actually managed to break down the door. They didn't get inside, though. And finally, and this is my last slide, um, the uh, uh, images, I've got to borrow something from Picasso here, but the images that are used to express resistance still hark back to images of the clefts of people like Karaiskakis and especially Kolokotronis. And we, we forget nowadays, because that's not talked about very much in the school books, that Kolokotronis himself had a very difficult relationship with the Athens government and spent a lot of time in jail uh, for his opposition, especially to the monarchy. Um, but notice uh, in this uh, reproduction of Picasso, there's over, over the top, there's a Greek flag and then the, the cleftic figure. And at the same time, the enemy is being identified as uh, uh, the as, as foreign banks. So they're calling for the independence and nationalization of all banks and trade monopolies. And notice the sign at the top, it's exocleftis. Now that might sound really strange. Why are we saying out with the cleftis? No, that's the old name the thieves, the idea that all politicians are thieves and certainly all these foreign politicians are thieves. So one sign I saw said, uh, out with uh, foreign and local loan sharks. Uh, this was again, I think, during the, the uh, run up to the, and, and during the crisis. Brexit didn't happen, uh, Brexit did. Um, and I'm very happy that, that thanks to the generosity of the Greek government, I'm now going to be able to become a European again myself. But the point is that that um, Greece is always has always seen itself as a land of rebellious people, and that pushing back against a government that goes too far or tries to discipline the country too much is seen as part of a vibrant democracy. And so although I've been talking about the village as a model and a source for what we understand about the population that was involved in the 1821 revolution. I think it's also worth thinking for a moment that there may indeed be a direct connection, if not to 5th century BCE uh, democracy in Athens, then certainly to the ideals of the Dimodera Yerondia and to the continuing insistence of Greeks that they should and must resist especially foreign impositions of power. The Greek independence is something that is precious and it's fought for and the images that are invoked still hark back to forms of kinship that have almost disappeared uh, but which are still prominent in that one area in Crete. So when people complain about how the Cretans are so un unruly and rebellious, they have a very easy answer. They say, well, you teach us in school about the cleftis. So, chemis cleftis, he must say. We are also cleftis. Uh, and they play on that ambiguity of the word cleftis. So uh, to uh, end my, um, my uh, uh talk, uh, I want to um, return uh, to the uh, screen. And so, so um, uh, yeah, I'm just going to wrap up in, in one second um, by saying that uh, one of the most important uh, lessons I think we can learn from the Greek Revolution is that freedom in any form whether it's academic freedom, as Nick was kind enough to mention uh, earlier on, or national freedom, or simply the right to express your own opinion, is precious, but it is also a responsibility. Freedom is a social contract. Villagers understood this very well. Freedom was something that had to be gained together, fought for together, and also had to be enjoyed together. The freedom to break the regulations about wearing masks, for example, just because you don't think that 
you want your body to be interfered with by a government is misunderstanding the nature of freedom. And it's very interesting that in many ways, the Greek response to COVID has been a much more disciplined one than we've seen in the United States. Uh, that is, it was, and, and certainly in other parts of Europe, it was a response by people who understood you don't just do this for yourself, mm -hmm. you do it for others. So the spirit of Ali Lawithia has always been there. And I still remember being told about Ali Lawithia in a village where I did my first serious field work on the island of Rhodes, where I was told, unfortunately, it doesn't really exist anymore, but it does. And we have seen in the last decade numerous solidarity movements, including movements expressing solidarity with migrants, for example, against mm -hmm racist attacks on them emerging uh, in Greece. And I think that this is one of the precious legacies of the 1821 revolution. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Costa, am I on? Uh, thank you, Professor Herschel, for that sort of fascinating um, presentation. Um, the questions are coming in sort of um, thick and fast. I'll start with the um, first one from um, Conspiropolis. Um, in your opinion, how is the politics of village life manifested in modern Greek politics democracy? Well, uh, again, I think the, the most obvious way in which uh, we see it is that there is this sense of freedom is not mm. just an individual property. It, it's something that has to be enjoyed together. Um, and at the same time, we also see its limitations, that these clans continue to play an important role. And this is not just true of Greece. This is true. I mean, the United States, I mentioned the, the Roosevelt's and the Bushes, and of course, they had their Hatfields and McCoys. So they also had a patrilineal uh, kinship system in the past. So some of those values um, continue to operate, and they don't always operate democratically. Um, but I do think that there is a strong sense in Greece of, uh, collect, of a notion of collective response, collective social responsibility. Um, another way in which you sometimes uh, see uh, something that I think reflects that village spirit is uh, the move for uh, what, what they sometimes call autonomous or independent democracy. So more referendums, for example. Um, whether this will actually happen is another question. Um, sometimes the acrimony that's expressed in Greek Parliament, the, 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 but this is nothing in comparison with what we see in the United States. Um, it's actually, uh, I would say, perfectly legitimate uh, argument and debate. Uh, Greeks have always prided themselves, I think, on their capacity for debate and argument, and that is just as true in the village as it is in the parliament today. And it's a very precious property. Um, in some countries in the world, disagreeing publicly with people is considered dangerous or impolite. Uh, I think Greece's happiness depends on being able to continue to have lively political discussions. And when people say to me, oh, but you know, Greece is so polarized, but it's not really polarized because there is still an agreement to, to argue. And that's something that I don't see uh, necessarily happening um, in some of the more powerful countries of the world. Okay. Um, I've got a question here from um, Yanni Cartledge, who'll be one of our presenters in the next few months. Um, do you believe the clan persisted in the 19th and 20th century um, Greek diaspora? Uh, and even the 21st, and to what extent? So did the clan persist in the Greek diaspora? Yeah, um, it does, but it does particularly among Cretans, which is perhaps not surprising. Um, I have not seen very much evidence of it uh, among Greek Americans or Greek Australians. Um, and my knowledge of Greeks in Britain is mostly of Cypriot Greeks, where I would say it is not very strong at all. Um, and the reason, I think, is exactly the same reason uh, that it doesn't persist in the big cities, in Athens and Thessaloniki. Um, that is to say, when people have to live the compartmentalized lives of apartment life, of living in a flat, right, what are you going to do? It's, it's not so easy to mobilize your clanmates for collective action. But there are 
especially associations of Cretans um, in which, and, and even of, of, of specific clans from Crete, they do actually uh, continue at least to meet for Glendi or something. Uh, I'd say it's definitely weaker in the diaspora, yes. and it's pretty weak in most of Greece these days. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a question about the Krifas um, Hulia you had in your first um, slide. Mm. Um, most modern historians sort of agree that they were a bit of a fallacy, and I think they've been expunged from Greek history textbooks. Uh, yeah. What's your view, view on it? Well, I'm not a historian. I mentioned it because, again, it is part of the mythology, and I wanted to... Uh, but, I mean, it's clear that uh, at, at least in re in religious matters, the priest did take time uh, to instruct the children, and there is some evidence for that. Whether it was done really uh, in, in in such a secretive way or not, I I, I I tend to think you know there's been a lot of exaggeration there. But again, uh, this is something I think for the historians. Um, there were no there were not very many teachers available because there were not very many educated people available in in in, in the um in the in the villages if somebody went away and then somehow became more knowledgeable about the world outside they might be nicknamed daskalos um but as an institution i tend to think it didn't really uh, have much of a of a history now yeah. okay um question from um, petros um could you please elaborate on the notion of clans and names as corporations in Western mm. Crete and money? Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you. That's a that's a, a question I love to talk about because you know people forget. Uh, I mean, my own advisor John Campbell actually took a lot of persuading that the Cretans um, had uh, uh, clans because the Sarkasani didn't and probably never did, although um, a, a Greek. Uh, folklorists uh, by the name of Cavadias tried to prove that they were clan-based because he thought that way he could link them back to the ancient Yeni, uh, you know, the, 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 the Genos of, of, of classical times, uh, which would have made no sense at all because all we, most of what we know about the Yenos in classical times comes from Attica and, of course, the Sarakatsani living up there in the north. Um, but what I mean by describing them as corporate is, first of all, that they they band together in the face of any serious opposition from outside. And they're segmentary in the sense that they do it at, at numerous levels. So for example, there's one clan, let's call them Skufades, it's a nickname that I gave them um, in this village of Zonyana, and they have four branches named for the four sons of the first Skufas. So the Mikhali, there's a Grigori, there's the Mitri, there's an the Anastidas, right? And then each of those breaks down into another set. So if a Michalis attacks a Dimitris, all the Michalides and all the Dimitris are going to be in two camps fighting each other. If somebody from another clan attacks either of them, the whole clan will be involved. So that's what we mean by segmentation. Um, it's very nicely, because it exists also in the Middle East, and it's very nicely summed up in the Arab proverb that roughly translated means um, I against my brother, my brother and I against our patrilateral cousin, my cousin, my brother and I against the world. Okay, so um, now they're corporate in the following sense. They also tend to own, not so much own property together, but the houses are often clumped together. Houses are transmitted in the male line. So they have a sense of owning a neighborhood. And again, in Zonyana, there are such neighborhoods. In the Mani, they tended to own one of these towers, you know, these famous Maniat towers. Um, and they would certainly <coughs> um, work together, uh, come together uh, to do battle with each other. And they would be shooting cannon at each other between the towers. Obviously, once, uh, once uh, the revolution succeeded, the central authorities in Athens wanted all of this to stop. The Maniats were not very happy about this, and they continued, like the Cretans, to resist. But because the Mani is a much poorer uh, place in terms of natural resources, um, they were, and also it's closer to the centers of power, both in the Peloponnese, Patras, for example, and even to Athens, 
um, it was in the end, I think, less successful in maintaining the, the, that, the corporate nature of the clans. But John Campbell, you know, I mean, he, he was an honest, wonderfully honest man and a great uh, supervisor of my research, uh, and really like a sort of father figure, but he, he was very determined to, to test whether I really was right about this. And he held a seminar, so my book, The of Manhood, which I'm going to show you right here. Um, this is the book that Nick was kind enough to mention. Um, and um, uh, he didn't believe that, that uh, well, at least he would say they wanted to be persuaded. So he had a seminar. Uh, and when the group of people got together, and I wasn't part of that, uh, looked very carefully at the evidence. He then said, well, yes, you know, apparently you're right. This is not the Greece I know. So in the North, at least among the Sarkatsani, at his time, there were no clans. Now, I don't know if that was true 100 years earlier. It seems to me that there was something, there was a recognition that the Kare Skakidas actually had a, a, some kind of corporate identity, but it must have weakened very quickly after the revolution. And, you know, it may just have been a way of adapting to the new realities of power on, on, under the new Greek state that the family unit could survive as a unit, whereas the clan was simply asking for trouble. That didn't scare the Cretans or the Maniats one bit, and that's why even to this day, they do still have a very strong sense of clan identity. Okay. Um, got a question here from uh, Mary Rarakis. Um Thank you for your presentation. Um, recent shootings and killings in the village of Anoya, are the clans and families these days responding differently compared to a few generations ago? Yes, I think um, is, is, is that's that's a, a, a very uh, in, important question. Um, and Anoya, of course, is right next to Zonyana. So Zonyana has also been affected by some of this. There have been similar things happening there too. Um, the killings usually take place over property disputes, and that's pretty much as it used to be. In the old days, uh, the police, whether it was a matter of a killing or something relatively minor, like sheep theft, would send one officer, or at most two, who would go to the village president, and they would go together to, um, uh, to arrest the miscreant. And so there would be a compromise between uh, the local custom and the national authorities. That, in more recent years, has completely disappeared. There's a young generation now of police, uh, mostly, I may say, not all, but many of them are very far-right political persuasion, who just, all they want is to get at those criminals, and they are not willing to treat this as um, the as, as, as something that really continues practices that according to my friends in Dunyana, yeah. I had actually maintained a very low level of homicide until quite recently. Because if you knew that you kill, if when you killed somebody, your whole family would eventually be wiped out, right? Because there'd be a, vent, a series of, of killings and counter killings. You thought very carefully before you killed anyone. What's happening now is that some young people uh, are taking it on themselves. The ones who in Zonyana provoked the police raid in 2007 were not approved by the majority of the villagers. Um, and, uh, and that's a whole long and complicated story, which I tell in a new book that's coming out uh, later this year. But, um, uh, you know, the, the majority of the villagers didn't approve of, of, of this kind of violent behavior. However, when the police attacked in force on mass, they sent, I think it was 600 commandos into the village, a village of what, 450 people. Um, the villagers reacted on mass as well because their logic is the logic of the segmentary clan. You attack one of us from outside, we all stand together, right? So that's, that's the problem that, the, in other words, the, the, the legitimacy of the, of, the of the nation state is always challenged by these kinds of situations. It's, it's power to enforce the law. And this is partly because the story of the nation state is based on rebellion. Now look at Australia, right? The Australia prides itself on its convict history. Look at the United States, rebels against the British crown. And then of course the Confederate states tried to do the same thing in miniature. 
they didn't get away with it, but that's another story. Um, so, you know, all of these attempts, successful and other, to create a national identity that is based on rebellion also contain within themselves the very real possibility that there's some kind of rebellion at the local level. And what I think is happening now is that young people who are not really all that close to their, their parents and grandparents um, are get, taking it on themselves to develop an exaggerated model of traditional behavior, brandishing guns in ways that their fathers and grandfathers would never have done, going on massive raiding expeditions involving not just sheep, but guns and even women, where uh, the older people in the village thoroughly disapprove of these practices. So this recent exaggeration has come about because on the one hand, um, the, the, the new consumerism has given them a lot more money and a lot more opportunities. But on the other hand, the state is, I, in my view, um, some of the authorities have really mishandled that, those kinds of situations. And, and it's very difficult to know how it's going to develop, but I'm very glad you raised that question. I will say that the majority of the people of my generation and older, um, and some of the people in those villages who live to be very old, um, really disapprove of these more violent uh, attacks. Um, if you've still got a bit more energy, I just might take two final questions, Professor Hurstfield. Um, once from uh, our very good friend, Nikos Papasteriadis, uh, is there any evidence of the popular support for resistance during the revolution? We hear a great deal about the role of leaders, including that leftists, but what do we know about the audacity of the peasants and their willingness to go into battle and stand up for their freedom? What values can be traced in the actions of the peasants and villages? Well, you know, peasants, um, I'd like to make a distinction between peasants and shepherds because peasants, you know, farmers, in other words, tend to be more uh, yeah, peace loving because partly because for them, any kind of violent outbreak of war is, is disastrous. Nonetheless, during the war of independence, it's very clear that uh, there were many areas in which the peasants joined in the, the, especially once they saw which way the wind was blowing, partly because they didn't want to be on the wrong side and partly because they really saw an opportunity, I think, to, uh, or they thought they saw an opportunity for better times. Once the Greek state was established and started tax, taxing them, then of course uh, things got a little different. But um, there's plenty of evidence for uprisings um, uh, all across the, the Greek countryside. Uh, and certainly on Crete, that was also the case. It wasn't just the highland villages. The difference is the highlanders, the shepherds in the highlands especially, uh, are much more able to conceal themselves. And so, you know, they tended to emerge also as, as leaders of these, of these movements. Um, we also know that there were areas uh, where people just didn't, as there were among the clergy, they, they didn't want to cross the Ottomans. They thought it was too dangerous. Um, in 1821, most peasants didn't have an ethnic sinidisi. They didn't have an understanding them, of themselves as Greeks. They saw themselves as Christians. Um, many of them were multilingual, so they would speak maybe a Slavic language, some Turkish and some Greek. Um, and so the reasons for joining the revolution were also not as clear and not as compelling for them as they perhaps seem to be in retrospect. With that said, uh, the evidence does seem to suggest that uh, throughout the first two decades of the 19th century, the idea of a national resurgence was actually beginning to gain a real following uh, among the rural, rural mm -hmm. peasantry. So I think this, the evidence is, 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 is mixed, but, but certainly there's some. Okay. Um, the question from Drunken Sulis, did the Ottomans try and break up the clans in a divide and conquer approach to maintain their control in Greece specifically and the Balkans in general? Mm. That's an interesting question because, of course, the Ottomans themselves were organized in clans and the, 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 the still, clans are still very much part of Turkish uh, social organization, especially in the countryside. So I think the answer is they didn't target the clan as an institution, but they did target specific clans that they saw as troublemakers. And in a funny kind of way, that's what the Greek government does when, not so much the government, 
but local police. So just to give you an, an example from Zanyana, what I was told by villagers over and over that um, if you happen to have a certain surname that was recognizably a Zonyana surname, you were driving along in your truck thinking, you know, I'm just going to go home now and go to sleep. And you'd be stopped by a policeman, sent minutes to saw you the surname, he said, ah, you're from Zonyana, get down, lie on your face, get up and dance at the point of a gun, you know, humiliating these people. So the clan identity, which in larger terms is seen as advantageous, then becomes a real liability in that sense. Uh, I think that the, uh, the the Ottomans, I mean, I'm not a historian. My sense is that the Ottomans understood that some clans were much more powerful and also were much better at attaching clan clans to themselves. And I've seen that happen in, in, in the village too, by the way, where during elections, one clan dominates the election by actually persuading other smaller clans to throw in their lot with it in exchange for various forms of protection. So obviously the, the, the Ottomans understood this perfectly well because their own social structure was very much of a clan-based one. And, and, the, and, and where do you see the structure of the Greek village 30, 40 years from now? Well, it depends a great deal on whether the reverse flow from the, from the city into the village continues. My guess is that it will for some while yet because now with the economic crisis, Although I, in my recent visit to Athens, I saw also very encouraging signs of, of recovery. Um, but I also think that um, as urbanized villagers move back into the village, they're going to take the values of the polykatikia back with them. <laughs> you know, they, they, they live in physical units that are not conducive to thinking in clan terms. So yes, they may form clan associations in their villages and so on. You're not going to see a sudden uptick in um, you know, uh, vendettas between clans and things of that sort. What you're going to see, I think, is a, a, a lot more folklorization of that history. And that's going to mean more dance troops. It's going to mean uh, probably all sorts of new developments for tourism, uh, presentations of our Greek tradition, which will have, in fact, been adapted for these new circumstances. And let me say that one of the things that I've always enjoyed about Greece is the extraordinary adaptability of the Greek people. I mean, they, they adapt to new services. I suppose most people in the world do, but, but I've, I've watched how it works in Greece. And I'm pretty sure that what you're going to see is a reconfiguration of the traditional Greek world. You already see it, interestingly enough, in food. Um, Greek food used to be pretty standardized. Uh, now you suddenly have, even in a country which still doesn't officially acknowledge ethnic minorities, you have ethnic minority foods being touted um, even by official sources. You have, um, you have uh, uh, local specialties and you have a much more adventurous uh, uh, style of new, new Greek cooking in the cities and in the countryside. Uh, so that what's happening uh, is that in a, a very practical and adaptive way, Greeks are saying, okay, we're going to have to live in villages again. You know, the, the city is not viable for all of us. How can we make it worthwhile? How can we make it entertaining for us and at the same time money spinning for us and for our community? And uh, that's why, you know, for all that Greeks love to tell you how the crisis has ruined them, there's no going back, and so on and so forth. I see that as part, again, of a strategy of saying, don't expect too much from us. But if there's one thing, one figure that, for me, exemplifies how what the Greek in crisis, it's the model of the katafertis, the fixer, the guy who can get things, or the woman who can, can make things happen by intelligently adapting to the realities of the situation. And as long as Greeks see that as part of their national tradition, if you will, um, they're going to apply it uh, to making the village, again, a viable site. But it's not going to be a viable site for subsistence farming because that's no longer possible. There's no longer any way in which a village is going to be able to go it alone in the way that they did in the early 19th century. What you're going to see instead is a 
development of the countryside as an economic resource. And that, I must say, I think is no bad thing. And it may be ecologically also uh, very much the advantage of the country as a whole. Again, look at that sign I showed you, Biologi Caliergia, biological cultivation in one of the most, quote unquote, traditional villages of Crete. So I think it is that adaptability, or as I like to call it in Greek, evligisia, flexibility, that is really a characteristic uh, of the Greeks today. Uh, and they are showing it in uh, dealing remarkably well with a situation in which economically and politically a great deal has been stacked against the country. Um, Professor Hersfeld, I promise you one last question. I think we need a Fustanella question, and this is from Vasu. Um, so the fact that the number of folds in the Ebsonis skirt is to demonstrate the number of years under German occupation is a fallacy, especially if the skirt predates occupation. I, I do not know about that. It is not, uh, but, but I mean, the skirt does predate uh, the yeah. occupation and I, I, would, I would be very suspicious of any such story. I never actually heard that story. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of stories that tourists are told uh, in Greece. Uh, and again, part of the story that the Fustanella is Greek costume. Fustanella was worn by Romyi, people of Greek Orthodox religion, speaking Greek, but more commonly Albanian or Slavic language. Um, and it was a relatively small proportion of those who were actually primarily Greek speakers. And there were many other forms of costumes. So actually you do see now in national parades, you see one group of men wearing the vraka, but those men are dressed up as Cretans. So this is a, an acknowledgement of Crete's special role. Okay, but, but you know, this, this use of tradition um, is, it, of course, the, the tourist guides are going to tell all sorts of stories and there may be some basis in it. I honestly do not know the answer to that one, but I would be as suspicious as you are. Okay. Um, Professor Hurstful, all that remains to me just to thank you for, again, another fascinating presentation and apologies if you sort of tired you a bit with the sort of um, the question time. You normally went a bit longer than usual, but um, there was a bit of flow there. Um, thank you very much. Congratulations thank again you. on your upcoming um, um, citizenship. And thank we you. hope to see you in Australia uh, sooner than later. Thanks uh, as soon as I can make it. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you all. Good night.